Hello, lovelies. Well, I am very excited because last week's podcast actually created the most discussion that I've ever had. And I've been having so much fun talking to you about it. And um, the first thing I want to say is that I don't know. (laughs) I'm reading you Ingo's ideas. I'm currently loving playing with Ingo's ideas. And I'm trying them on for size, but I'm As I've said before, not psychic, don't remember by past or in between lives. So I don't know. I can only tell you what Ingo says. And to that point, today I'm going to go through a journey through multiple lives as defined by Ingo because there's information there that in trying on (laughs) makes incredible sense to me in my day-to-day battle with my internal self. But before I go there, I want to address this idea of fame. And so when Ingo's talking about famous people or highly developed souls, they are more able to activate deep and profound awareness as they pass through the death pattern and through the in-between lives area as they are going into a new body. And Ingo says that, in fact, such a person will actually have some choices in what takes place. First of all, they need not mindlessly gravitate to the nearest copulation or unknowingly just get caught up in a fortuitous new body arrangement. They can select a new family or an environment that will be propitious to their desires and goals. They can make a decision perhaps not to re-embody or reincarnate at all and can stay by selection in the spirit world, provided only that their compulsive desires, if they still have any, do not drag them hypnotically and magnetically into a new re-embodied situation. And therein, darling, lies the crux And this is what I'm dealing with on a daily basis. (laughs) We're going to get into it today. There are forces at work, internal and external, and two externals that we will get into that relate to this fame business are the fates and the destinies. And from reading my beloved Ingo, we're talking about netters here. (laughs) In a very Egyptian sense. And he explains how these have just been basically disregarded in our fabulous materialist prison paradigm. So we're going to get into that because this is one thing that's really interesting. But today we're going to get into lusts and desires. And these are the things that mess me up every day. And they're not as exciting as you might think. I have this thing about a cup of tea, damn it. If I don't have a cup of tea, then I'm ruined for the rest of the day. And Sabrina, I'm talking to you, girl. I see you in your coffee. So these can be (laughs) like the least exciting lusts. And they're a thing because they're going to cause problems for us. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen Roy... Uh, Roy is a computer game in one of my favorite cartoons, Rick and Morty. And Roy is like this game where you live an incarnation of somebody's life in the game and you score points for how you do things and how you handle situations. And this part of the book really makes me think that we're kind of living in this Roy game and uh, we're scoring points against our lusts and desires in a way. So I'm going to um, find the part in the book, (laughs) here we go, and uh, read it to you because it's interesting. (sighs) First of all, we were talking about the highly developed person and how they can make decisions and not mindlessly jump into the nearest copulation. They can make decisions about embodying or not embodying. And all of this involves the traditional esoteric idea of learning to rise above 
the physical desires. But I'm bump. <laughs> How easy is that? Whoa. Okay. For if one cannot do that physically, the soul spirit will yearn to engage once again in those type of situations that will allow for the continued experiences of those desires. Here, desires should be read to mean lusts. Even if they are moderately highly developed in terms of psychic awarenesses, the transiting individual soul spirit will be unable to resist temptation and will plunge once again into a lifespan that will enable them to resume gratification. Now, when I was a little girl and I would be in bed and my daddy would come in and rub my back and he was a Freemason and I would say, Daddy, what happens to you after you die? Well, Daddy basically explained this to me in a really, really clear way. So Daddy would say there's an elevator in heaven, an elevator that would go up through many different floors, just like a department store. Because in those days, there was department stores we would go to that had elevators through different floors, like ladies' wear, men's wear, housewares. And he said, if you really, really liked ice cream, then when you get to the floor of ice cream, you'll just float off the elevator and go into the ice cream life. Or if you really, really like dancing, then you'll go past the dancing floor and that will grab your attention and you will be dragged, not dragged, but you'll float off into the dancing level. And if you like sex and drugs and rock and roll, then when you get to the sex and drugs and rock and roll level, you'll be attracted out into that level. And so that was a very nice way of describing <laughs> I guess exactly what Ingo is talking about here, that our lusts are the things that interfere with our conscious reincarnation. Liberation, Ingo says, when it does come about, does not come from denying lusts and cravings when you truly desire them, but from changing your psychic priorities so that lusts and cravings occupy only a minimal place in your scheme of existence. Now, this one has been really hard for me, remains to be really hard for me, because lusts are not just what we think. Like, I gave up the smoking. Damn, I'm very proud of myself, but I miss it. But see, that's a very good example of changing the priorities. But... As Ingo goes on to say, lusts are just obvious things. Sexuality, eating, drinking, the major physical lusts are not the only cravings there are. There are also the lusts of participation, the desire to take part in some human enterprise, whether of crime or creativity, making a war, making peace, governing, being a slave, and so forth. All these and many more are conditions that take lots of people and distinctive environments for their fulfillment. And many souls desire to be part of them. As mentioned elsewhere, the two major lusts are for power and money. For it is with these that the average human can extend themselves through the human fabric. But comparatively few that have achieved money or power use them for good purposes. Money is usually used to gratify other desires and power to control other people, especially through establishing and supporting those illusions that are characteristic of the equalizer, otherwise known as our paradigm. There are some souls that have achieved psychic liberation and are free of compulsive lust and cravings. Some of these go on to works that are quite alien to humans, but some elect to try to help humanity or individuals to raise its overall psychic quotient level. To do this at all, they must remain invisible to the paradigm, while at the same time affecting some positive upward changes in it. 
a difficult and challenging task indeed. These souls are commonly called masters, and in occult and esoteric texts, they traditionally operate behind the scenes. The reason for this invisibility have never really been understood, because the equalizer and its methods have never been brought to light. Once the equalizer slash paradigm is understood, the reasons for the anonymity and invisibility of the masters become clear. Outwitting the equalizer is no easy task. The major thing that governs all the death, rebirth, re-embodiment, and reincarnational sequences is that the vast majority of souls want to have only a limited and limiting life experience. This is to say that they lust after compartmentalization. They like being a certain type of personality whose roots and reasons for being are so deeply embedded in the psychic substrata of the soul. When the death process of one embodiment takes place, The soul gravitates to environments and life situations that will allow them to re-dramatize the major constituent characteristics of the certain type of personality they crave to express. Now, we've seen that in real life, right? So that girl that keeps falling for the bad guys, it's like we have these patterns so deeply ingrained in us that even when we're conscious of them, even when we can say, you know what, I know I have a problem, I only like those bad guys, we cannot seem to break the cycle and we just keep going for them till I guess the pain gets too great. But this is the same thing that's happening at the soul level as well. When the soul expressions are combined with physical lusts and cravings, the soul re-embodies time and again In nearly identical life sequences, the soul then undergoes long sequences of many lifetimes, being essentially the same type of personality again and again and again. The major reason for this is that the preferred type of personality will enlarge, fit into the equalizer and its patterns, making the life expression relatively easy round peg, round hole. This is actually the line of least resistance in the overall re-embodiment process. But as a result, billions of souls are effectively trapped and live countless lives as victims in the human fabric. In the esoteric literature, this type of living is called the downward path. Downward because all lines of least resistance eventually piddle out and become impassable, and because it is the nature of the equalizer to convulse at intervals, crushing everything and everyone in it. If the souls, the you, is fixated on retreating to another line of least resistance, one will normally adopt a new lifestyle that appears to be acceptable within the human fabric. When the human fabric, that is to say the equalizer slash paradigm, governs the direction of your history in terms of eternity and infinity, then you'll be forced downwards towards lesser and more constricted forms of life expression. Okay, so there's some good news here. (laughs) If you're listening to me, then you are not fixated in retreating to the line of least resistance. I can tell you that much. So that's really, really good news. But I think we all know people who have. The people that seem to be stuck in the mire that are just going with the stream of life. So kids, we're doing something right. So here is that Roy part of the book, the part that shows you how your lusts and desires move you from section to section, and I found this fascinating. So I'm going to just read it to you and mm, 
feel into it. Feel into, it might be easier for some because it starts out with being a mother, but feel into how it feels to let these lusts and cravings guide you through this journey. Let's say some time ago you liked being a mother because families are acceptable within the equalizer and the mother occupied a good position. So you were a mother through several lives. But since the equalizer is never stable for very long, and in fact two or more equalizers can come into contest with each other, war breaks out. You suddenly saw your sons and husbands slaughtered because your home was bombed and you yourself got killed. War was now in, in terms of the equalizers. And so taking the line of least resistance, you become a warrior or a soldier whose life were temporarily being valued by the equalizers. But then peace arrives and there was no place for warriors. Warriors were now unemployable and detested. And if you, as a soldier, found yourself on the losing side of a war, you were executed as a war criminal. Executioners, though, were now in and elevated to a high place as judges or repairers of the peace. So you shifted over to becoming an executioner. But too late. The human fabric had changed again and executioners became unemployable. Their place had now been taken by diplomats. And just as you'd gotten to this new life cycle, the equalizer fluxed again and diplomats became the target of terrorists. And you were blown up by one of their bombs. So you became a terrorist for only one life, only to be killed again in some skirmish or perhaps rubbed out when your usefulness as a terrorist was no longer necessary to the powers working within the equalizer. But you notice that terrorists and powers that control them valued women, especially prostitutes, and gave them money and cared for them. So following this line of least resistance again, you became a prostitute. But this conflicted you too deeply with the motherhood you had lived many lifetimes through, and you eventually suffered a psychotic break because of the conflicting soul values that are part and parcel of your overall psychic makeup. But you found that psychotics are fed and clothed by society and cared for for some degree. So you became a habitual psychotic for a couple of short lifetimes up until the point when you noticed that warders of psychotics led better lives than the psychotics themselves. So you re-embodied with the goal of becoming a warder, which meant you were eminently employable within the equalizer, which has multiple uses for all kinds of warders and wardens. Now you began a soul career that took up 10 lifetimes working on behalf of the equalizer to control people. But in the 10th lifetime, you re-embodied in Germany in the 20s and, because of the line of least resistance, became a Nazi concentration camp warder and were suddenly hung as a war criminal. And the cries that you were only following orders were to no avail. This time, rather than reinstate the cycle by becoming an executioner of war criminals, you noticed that the victims of war crimes were being valued. So you shifted your compartmentalization and re-embodied as a victim or potential victim in search of a victimizer. You barely reached the age of 16 before you found one who raped and strangled you and was shortly paroled after having spent only three months in jail. Your psychic rage at the rape and murder was so great that in the disembodied state you gravitated to the body of the murderer. You were sucked into his next sex act, which resulted in the pregnancy of a young girl of the poorest and criminally oriented class. 
And thus, you were born into an environment and a moral system characteristic of this lifestyle. In this life, you were born a boy, but because any significant role models were absent from your environment, and because you possessed a soul hatred of your father, you became a homosexual with sadistic bent. But much to your surprise, you died of AIDS when you were only 17. But not before you'd begun to notice that the preachers of the moral majority were very vocal against homosexuals and the threat of AIDS. You noticed this, of course, but it was because you also noticed that these people valued motherhood, were militant and were acting as judges. Here was a package that resembled three separate life cycles experiences of your own. So you gravitated to one of these families and were eventually born into the family of a notorious, bigoted preacher, a family in whose bosom and environment your new brain plate will be programmed with their values. In this family, you will grow up not knowing at all that you, with a capital Y, possesses a vast spectrum of conflicting past life experiences any and all of which may manifest as your character develops. The esoteric literature calls all this the downward path, but not because of the life experience it involves. No guilt is to be apportioned out because it is safe to say that every soul on earth has a somewhat similar history. The wisdom of the esoteric writers call this downward because it cycles around and around and creates whirlpools that automatically drag into them all souls who lack the psychic power to extricate themselves from them. The upward path consists of extricting the you from this fatal and continuing engulfment of the surrounding forces that automatically attract your lusts and cravings. This can only be done by breaking into your own soul, oversoul, the you, breaking apart your desire for compartmentalization and stopping the soul's tendency from popping back and forth between the pillars and posts of the ongoing spiritual whole life process. And this can only come about by activating your innate psychic capabilities for with these you will be able to see through all the fruitless compartmentalizations that clutter your oversoul. When these compartmentalizations become transparent to your psychic awarenesses, the compulsions, that is, the entrapped energies and forces in them, almost always just drain away. If you can eventually see psychically, the greatest scene of both your own you as well as the equalizer, the fabric and the psychic structures that are holding them in place, you will begin to experience and benefit from the liberations that characterize the upward path. Okay, so this is akin to seeing our society. This is akin to seeing the materialist prison paradigm the algorithms, the social forces that try to direct our lives. So it's akin to seeing all of those things and not being sucked into them. Okay, so that is growing the seed of the soul. And it starts, as Shauna said, <laughs> by getting your mind right. And you can see a very similar process here on Earth. You can see that there are people that buy the get a good job, get a wife, get two kids and a dog and a white picket fence storyline or whatever that has become these days. The equalizer slash paradigm storyline. And you can also see those people that are not buying it. <laughs> They're seeing the outside equalizer, as he wants to call it, or paradigm as I call it, and calling bullshit. This is not true. And hopefully, they're also seeing their own bullshit 
inside of their own lives and calling that out as well. So I don't know about you, but I find this fascinating and I can see, like I can see the echo in real life compared to the whole over life journey. Like how many times are we drawn because of our lusts into certain situations? When I was younger, I had this lust, so many lusts, my Lord, lust for nice clothes, lust for nice things, lust for nice men. And luckily, I've graduated. All you have to do is catch me on a Saturday night in my best gear to, to realize that I've given up on the nice clothes thing and the nice men for that matter. But I still have so many left. But I still have so many left. T, for example, that's just the beginning. And this also really fits in <laughs> with Brad Clausen's storyline in season two and three. And I've mentioned Brad before about, you know, the seven deadly sins and how they are the thing stopping you. And really, when we were talking about this, we were talking about it in the context of one life. And that's why Brad laughs and says, I'm not doing it because I don't want to give up on chocolate and women. But I don't know if any of us realize that it's not just this life, that it's the ongoing series of lives. And doesn't it make sense? As above, so below. The same things that catch you down here are the same things that catch you up there. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me, which is why I like Ingo. But again, I'm not there. I don't know. I can just see the analogies between my lived experience and what he's saying in this book and extrapolating my lived experience in this life into the afterlife. And I think the most important thing is it makes me be aware that I need to squish these lusts or the control that they have over me. And it's not just tea, it's my compulsion to learn and my compulsion to share and all of these things, these things that drive me. So I might be going up that elevator and see a library and we're all like, ah, oh, that's so elevated to be drawn to a library. Well, apparently, no, it's not. And that's the other thing, right? There's no judgment. This is just stimulus response. The only thing that I'm going to judge in this, and we'll get into this more, because I keep saying, you know, the equalizer and, and paradigm, there is many similarities there and many differences. And we haven't yet got into what the equalizer is, but you kind of get the gist. But we'll get into that more because that's the only thing I will judge in this process. But anyway, my lovelies, I hope you enjoyed this. I uh, loved that when I read that. So I hope you enjoyed it too. More soon, darlings. Thank you for listening, lovelies. And if you like this podcast and would like to support us, please go to MagicalEgypt.com and I have made a special discount coupon just for you all. And the coupon code is LOVE. And that will get you $30 off any Magical Egypt purchase. Also, um, I've started a Patreon. So you can mosey on over there and uh, see if you want to contribute. But I appreciate you listening and I appreciate all your support. And more soon.